Thank you. Hi guys, thanks for coming tonight. And tonight we, oh, just skip the blockchain, <laughs> wrong direction. Okay, we want to talk about AI strategy and techniques for leaders. This, this is actually for leaders and product managers. So I wonder how many of you are product managers here? Nice. And how many are going to become a product manager? It's also nice. How many of you are entrepreneurs? Oh, we have quite a bit of entrepreneurs. That's nice. Now, we, uh, I worked at Yahoo before as a product manager, senior product manager. And uh, then we formed as a part with my partner, Mute AI. And Mute AI is an AI consulting company. And what we do, we go to mid-sized businesses and analyze the business requirements and analyze the business, then actually provide them solutions. So unlike regular technology, uh, technology solution companies, we actually approach from the product side first. So look at the product. So that will be more likely uh, to your liking. Now, today I want to talk about a couple things. Uh, we are, and we are not going to talk about a couple other things. So we are not going to talk about why AI. Uh, I assume already you already know that why companies have to move to AI or why they are moving AI today. And we are also not, not going to talk about the algorithms. You can find lots of other presentations, also lots of information which algorithm to use, which framework to use, or which technology to use, so to say, to, to run your machine, uh, to run your uh, AI solutions on. But what we are going to talk about, and th these kind of presentations are very rare nowadays, how can you uh, strategize AI in your business? And that applies especially for product managers today because product managers own the products and they can understand how to apply technology to, to these products. And when we think about strategy and business, uh, we are looking at five different aspects. So the first one is uh, people, the people aspect of the business, then the practice aspect of business, then the solution aspect of a business, and environment and partnership aspect of the business. Now, I said we are not going to talk about why AI, just I have one slide. Uh, today, a business is either integrating AI technology or they're just dying. Uh, there, there is, it's a no-brainer situation nowadays. It's the fourth industrial revolution. So if the company, the product manager, the CEO, CIO, if they don't have a strategy in mind to implement AI in their different processes, uh, the company is going to die in the future because there is huge competition going on. If you look at these numbers here, uh, for example, healthcare companies who have an AI strategy have about 15 to 20 percent competitive advantage over all other companies. And these numbers are, these margins are really interesting because most of the industries, their margins are not that high. There is no like 80 percent margin. So we are talking about here a couple percent of margin. It makes a big difference especially in areas like uh, tourism or uh, package good retail. Now, there is one more reason I, I want to really underline. This, these are just two slides about why AI. And the first one was, okay, every, you have to do it because there's competition. Second one is uh, coming from Jeffrey Moore uh, from the Crossing the Chasm. Product managers most probably know. How many people know Jeffrey Moore? Right. Uh, Almost everybody knows Jeffrey Moore. So Crossing the Chasm, very, very famous book. And he, say, he has a really good point here. He says, in the US especially, we will never have the chance or we will never have the uh, luxury to have the lowest cost of labor. That's not going to happen. Uh, but what we have is we must continue to exploit advantages further up the value chain. That means new technologies like AI, new technologies like IoT, or any other like even blockchain, those technologies, we have to really push the envelope every time. And that is, that is our responsibility as product managers. Now, when we look at businesses, and we did that with my partner in the last uh, six months, we went to like 50, 60 mid-sized businesses. We talked to C-level executives, we talked to VPs. And the problem we have seen is that the companies look from the business perspective. And that's what we name business domain. We talk about revenue, we talk about cost, we talk about marketing, and we talk about partnership. But when you look at it from a technology perspective, like AI technologies, 
we are, this is the language, image recognition, recommendation engine. Uh, and which algorithm to use, what prediction, uh, what is the bias in these algorithms. And what we've seen is that there is a big gap. Companies don't know how to jump this gap. And honestly, technical people also cannot figure out how to jump this gap here to the other side. And there's a big opportunity we see that, especially for product managers and service companies, to, to close the gap, to connect the business domain to the, to the technology domain. And that is also what's happening in, in bigger companies today, like leaders uh, like Google, Amazon, uh, Yahoo. These companies can understand the business domain as well as has the technology side, and there are lots of product managers who close the gap. Okay. Now, what we shouldn't be doing is this. So you have a business here, your current profit, and hopefully this is your target profit, much higher. And picking a technology and sticking with the technology is not the solution. Uh, the solution is not picking Kira's and saying, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to bring AI to my company. Or I'm going to pick TensorFlow and that will solve the solution. In fact, today, if you go to some companies, like if you consult with Amazon, of course, they're suggesting their own technology base. They're giving you that one tool which you think maybe it will solve all your solutions. But this is not the case. And this is what we name, of course, Maslow's law, hammering the problem. So you have a technology and you try to hammer it. We also see it in smaller companies. Like we had a client and they had one data scientist who could use only one language and the company couldn't scale because that language didn't allow scalability in the platform. And they couldn't... Oh, really? Sorry. There was a speaker. Uh, there was a mic actually somewhere here, right? Brian, do you have the mic? No, this is for recording. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Test. All right, here we go. Better? Wonderful. Now, uh, picking a technology and trying to solve all your cognification is actually not the solution. So what do we need to do? We have to change the strategy. And uh, Henry Minsker, the m famous management scientist, mentioned about this. This is named the strategic change. Very simple, there's nothing smart about it. But uh, the idea is that uh, a strategy is an organization, organization's response to environmental change. And AI is an environmental change. Uh, not just from competition perspective, also from other perspectives. Now, how would works is that very, very simple graphic here. Uh, there's an intended strategy, of course. There are some strategies dropped, and then emergent strategy comes in, and in this case, AI is the emergent strategy, and you join it. And this is the definition. Uh, he talks more about it, but basically, we need a strategic change. And what is, what is the strategic change? We name it cognification. I don't know where this originates from, but it's an interesting word which summarizes lots of things into one cognification, meaning that your company can utilize AI technologies to gain competitive advantage, even become a, uh, become a market leader. So we're going to dive a little deeper into con cognification, but not deep because there are many, many broad concepts around it, and we, we are going to talk a little about it. And when we talk about, think about cognification in businesses, we really think about these five aspects. Uh, we mentioned people, practices, solutions, environment, and relationship. Now, let's dive a little deeper into it. Let's start with the people aspect. And the people aspect is really important because cognification is about everybody in the business. It's not just a data science team or it's not just a solution team. We are talking about uh, finance, sales, IT, QA. Everybody has to really have put the AI head on their, on their head and then uh, come up with solutions and solve their problems using AI. And the most important part is on the shoulders of the PM. And we name it AI PM, Artificial Intelligence Product Manager. And then Artificial Intelligence Product Manager differs from a regular product manager by these two, these two specific traits. One is uh, specific AI solution understanding. The other is AI product lifecycle knowledge. One is about execution, the other is about strategy. Uh, but 
in order to do this, you have to be a good product manager, have the core product management skills, and that is actually what product school does, right? Teaches you the product management skills. Then industry-specific domain expertise, that's something you need in order to actually bring, that, uh, bring those solutions to market in that company. And this is usually something either you learn or you study, but uh, there's not many schools about industry-specific domains. Now, if you fulfill all these uh, traits, uh, we name it Artificial Intelligence Product Manager today. Now, why do we need AI product managers today? Because, because technology is different. AI technology is not like a regular software. I mean, you don't, you don't, write, uh, you don't write AI code like you would write in the past regular software code with rules. Uh, in this case, we are talking about teaching the computer to do something instead of telling the computer what to do. But it's a totally different mindset, especially from engineering side, and that requires actual new understanding for the product manager to be able to use new methodologies uh, to, to drive AI solutions. Another thing is teams. Uh, as I said, teams are changing. Uh, there are different teams. We're going to go a little more into deeper into that. Then businesses. Uh, the processes are different, AI processes. We are talking about decision support system. We are talking about decision making system. If you bring a decision making system in a process which is already working, you most probably going to cut that process somewhere and uh, disconnect from, the, uh, from human. Uh, that's why businesses, business processes are changing. That's why we need artificial intelligence product managers. And also effects. Uh, there is lots of, lots of things going on about AI and security and privacy nowadays. You most probably heard about it. It's, that's another reason. And we know that today there is a huge shortcoming. There's a shortcoming on product managers because 10 years ago, product manager was the guy who would actually decide what color the Kellogg's box should be, right? <laughs> that was the product manager. But today, product manager leads to products like, uh, like big products, technology products, like search engines, uh, driving cars, self-driving cars. I mean, if there is, there is no product manager, you cannot develop these kind of solutions today. And that's why uh, there, is a, there is a need, but there is also lack. Uh, we need more product managers who understand uh, these technologies, at least from the, uh, from the business perspective. And uh, there is no school for it. Uh, I don't remember. Is there an AI product manager, uh, an AI product manager school somewhere? Uh, so that's why it will come most probably, but uh, it will take time. Then. Uh, industry experience, it is really varying. One project doesn't apply to another industry all the time. Uh, you're working on some uh, on a self-driving car solution. Uh, you most probably uh, cannot work on other NLP-related uh, technologies. So technologies kind of change, but the core, uh, the core product management skills skills won't change. And there are other things like there is no standard right now. It is The frameworks are coming together. It is really on the on the rise right now, so to say, okay? Now, if you look at a team, like how does a production team look like in an AI, uh, in an AI organization? And that's something uh, we have seen in larger organizations. Also, smaller organizations trying, I mean, mid-sized businesses try to get there. And so we are talking about a CAIO nowadays. And Andrew Andrew also uh, points this out. Every company in the future will have a CAIO. It's not the CTO, it's a new AI officer, chief AI officer. And that, that actual, that person leads, that role leads the AI initiative. Then AI product manager and AI product owner. These are really interesting, two new interesting roles which applies uh, to you all, uh, which we need to be able to drive AI products. And we have AI architect. You can find today AI architects. It's not that, not that hard, but it is much harder to find AI product managers. Uh, data scientists, uh, many schools actually teach data science, so it is easier to find data scientists and data engineers uh, who deal with data, who actually clean data or bring data in. It's actually much easier to find. And here are a couple of strategies. If you are, uh, if you are a product manager, and you have, a, you have a plan to integrate or use some AI technology, and you don't have the, if you don't have the talent, uh, there are ways to, ways to get them. Uh, there's a hiring strategy, training strategy, consulting, and this is very interesting, Cognify. There are tools and technologies today, you can replace some of the data science job, not, not the whole data science job, but part of it. 
And in fact, one, uh, I was talking to somebody in one of the meetings, and they gave a job to a data scientist. It took him like one month to do it. Then they found online uh, this web, as a, there is a tool named Data Robot. You might have heard of it. And he could do it in one week using Data Robot. And it's going to get more and more simpler. So once the tools and uh, technology will improve, we will see more and more cognification here. And there are ways to acquire these. Like, for example, you can, you can send your current engineers, uh, your scientists, to deep learning that AI course in Coursera. It's pretty good. Andrew Ange is giving this. It's like a, a three, four months course. And they can uh, get up to speed with uh, certain things like machine learning algorithms, AI algorithms. That's a pretty good course. Then on the consulting side, you can actually consult with these companies. Now, NVIDIA, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, they started creating these special teams uh, who support their platforms. And if you're a big company, of course, they work with uh, top 500 or top 1,000 companies, you can get uh, consulting, and they will take care of your AI needs. They will actually uh, create your architectures. And um, I also put ourselves here, move to AI in different places. We provide the support for mid-sized, small to mid-sized businesses, uh, unlike uh, these companies provide for the bigger sizes. And cognification, of course, data robot, cognitive scale, Crowdflower, they changed their name now, import IO. These kind of companies will be more and more in the future, and we will see actually they solve these AI problems on their side. And these tools are really important for you, for product managers, to be able to pick the right tool. If you need something fast done, maybe with 90% accuracy, okay, not 95% accuracy, uh, you may try it out on data robot or cognitive, cognitive scale and uh, solve the problem. If you, if you have to hire somebody, it's gonna take you three months compared to that, okay? Sure. Could you define cognition once again? I, I lost track of that. Of course. Cognification is uh, implementing AI technologies, using AI technologies in a company, in your whole company, in your whole business, uh, such that you gain a competitive advantage or become a market leader in that area. And we are going to talk about the process, like what I mean by business converting AI, where to use AI. Right? Now, let's talk about practices, right on point. And Practices. When we talk, when we say practices, practices are uh, business practices. And when you look at a company, when you look at a business, you can look at a product manager or as an entrepreneur or a service provider or consultant. From the AI perspective, you are looking for opportunities. So you, you ask yourself, how can I cognify this business? That means how can I bring AI in to gain advantage to actually improve something? And there are really four different ways you can bring advantage to a company. And one is automation. Automation means something is working with human power right now. And you want to bring AI to convert it to, uh, to, to some technology. And it doesn't mean there's a software solution. Today, most of the problems don't have a software solution because software rule-based systems don't apply to it. But you can find AI solutions to, to those problems. That is automation. You find a working process. Work is, it works great, but maybe it is, there is high human error, or maybe there is high cost, and you can bring in automation. Another one is optimization of the objectives. So that means you have a working system already, an AI system, which is suboptimal, and you're bringing some new AI technology, which is much better, and you're increasing the, increasing the, the performance somehow. Another one is expansion opportunities. So it happens actually with bigger companies. At Yahoo, we, we were expanding internationally. So we, we went and deployed to 30 different markets. And that requires a different perspective. You, you, you need new technology, new hardware, and you have to implement it, expand your technology. We have to rewrite our recommendation engine. And that actually is an opportunity there for AI. And uh, the last one is innovation opportunities. That is. If you have a research team, if you're looking like five years out, like 10 years out, and you want to have competitive advantage, want to be market leader like Google does, they're working on projects like 10 years out, then there is a big opportunity you can use AI technologies. Of course, all of this comes with a cost, and there is some complexity associated with it. And the complexity increases uh, towards right. So an automation project, uh, opportunity is fairly, 
comparably, uh, in general, easier than an optimization or expansion uh, opportunity. And uh, of course, innovation is the most uncertain one. It is more complex. The complex comes from there. And uh, this complexity can be anywhere in the organization. It can be organizational. It can be technological. It doesn't mean the complexity is coming from the algorithm. I mean, the complexity sometimes comes from the organization. For example, you want to automate a human process. Uh, people maybe are not OK with that. Now you have to deal with it and explain to everybody that what you're bringing to the table. Or uh, could be regulations. Uh, we, we started deploying to Italy a uh, recommendation engine. And then we figured out Italy doesn't allow you to crawl websites and put them on the website. So there are interesting regulations around the world, also in the US, especially nowadays with privacy and uh, security. Uh, you have to, this can become, this can re become really, really complicated. And you have, to, as a product manager, you have to take care of it. Nobody else will take care. Engineer won't look at it. Scientists won't look at it. Uh, CEO won't look at it. Uh, product manager has to take care of all of these issues here. Okay. And if you look a little more deeper uh, where the complexity originates from, I'm just going to point up a couple, couple here. For example, optimization. Optimization is really a technology bound. Comparably, technology bound process. Uh, if you find optimization, you really have to work on the last couple percent sometimes, and and that will actually uh, take lots of time. In an expansion, expansion opportunity complexity usually uh, comes from regulation and organization, especially if it is uh, geographical. And of course, innovations you don't know it can be any of them. Depends on the innovation. But usually, when we talk about innovation, we are looking really long term. And here are a couple of methodologies. Uh, these methodologies were created a long time ago, and we are talking about Agile a really long time ago, or design thinking. GV Design Sprint, just maybe a year. I don't know when they started, but I just saw it uh, this year. Now, there will be maybe newer methodologies, I don't know, uh, related to AI, because the process is a little different. But what you can do today, you can use a combination of these and create your own methodology. Uh, for example, for automation, you may mix up Agile and GV Design Sprint. Especially GV Design Sprint gives you gives you good view. That's a, that's a, that's a new method they're using. But what we came up with is this: we name it Agile AI Product Lifecycle, and it's a flexible framework where we then remove things. But the idea is that first you have to collect the information requirement and Design Sprint does it in five days. How many of you did, did hear from GV Design Sprint? Google Venture Design Sprint? So it's a, that's a really interesting framework uh, Google start using with their ventures. Uh, it's, it's fairly new, maybe six months, I don't know. I, I saw it like a couple months ago and I started working on it. And in five days, you come up with a prototype. It is so fast. And they say there is no project on Earth. You cannot do it in five weeks. They even tried it on some jet engine. A project. It even worked there in, in manufacturing. Now, that gives you a really good head start. Uh, then requirement analysis, sometimes it's short, sometimes it's a couple of days, sometimes it's uh, two weeks. But the main idea is here that AI projects have a second cycle here, which is optimization, uh, which is experimentation. You try to find the right solution. AI solutions are about search. You're searching for a solution. So. It's not like writing software where you have the rules, you just write the rules, then you test, 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 I mean, maybe you introduce new features. Here, you already have the code, you just try to optimize it. You're searching for the best algorithm. Sometimes you're running 20 algorithms, sometimes you're changing the data multiple times. So this process is interesting, this doesn't exist in, in other processes. Then, of course, once you're done with it, uh, there's an there's a engineering cycle, and this whole process is a cycle uh, on its own. And you can add remove to this. And we have seen actually a good advantage on using this, uh, especially the rapid experimentation and AI solution research is, is an interesting area. Here, for example, with AI solution research, you sometimes go look at GCP solutions, Amazon solutions, or different vendors outside, not just internally. And that was practices. Now, let's look at solutions, like from the AI perspective. 
how do we approach uh, uh, cognification from an AI uh, solution perspective? And the first, we need to understand where your business stands in the AI timeline. When you look at a business, when you look at a business, when you look at a business uh, or a business process, so to say, you have to understand where they are so you can come up with a solution, right? And in, the AI timeline looks like this. We had handcrafted knowledge. This is software today. We use it. It is regular if then else rule based systems. Uh, you want to write a, a thermostat or some controller. You say, is it 5 p.m.? Turn on the AC. That's, that's so simple, right? And then we have statistical learning that's next up. And this is what we name AI today. That is machine learning. And machine learning system, uh, it has lots of input variables, lots of uh, set, uh, lots of state. And what it outputs is that, for example, set AC278. It, it used that information, the input data, to figure out a relation, correlation to the output data. And it, it tells you what it is. So everybody knows this. Contextual adaptation. That is the next next wave. And contextual adaptation is self-generalizing -gener systems. We don't have this much today. We have gone like generative adversarial networks. And it is going towards, towards that. But a system would look like this. You have the context of the whole world. I mean, it can look at the environment. It can input every data. It's, you're not pushing the data. It already consumes, takes the data. It's data-hungry systems. And then it has a memory, of course. Today, we have similar solutions like LSTM, a long short-term memory systems on recurrent neural networks. And but it is still not this size, like not in a world context. And what it does, it sets the AC, for example, to 75. And at the same time, it decides to order ice cream. And uh, that's going to be possible uh, in the future, in the next five years, I believe. And next up is, of course, AGI. And it's an interesting name, Artificial General Intelligence. Ten years ago, this was AI. Now, AI started being used as ML. Uh, that's why now we need a new term, and now we have a new term named artificial general intelligence. And artificial general intelligence means uh, some artificial intelligence which can do human-like process, uh, human-like task, but not just do human-like task, but also acts free. So it doesn't care about human; it just does what it does because because it wants to do it, right? Like human, there there is no reason. Any other system is a servant to human. It just serves to human. Uh, this one doesn't have to serve to human. So this is, I don't know how far, but uh, it looks like we are going towards that. Still, I think there is lots of solutions here. Uh, we should be able to create solutions here in the next five years. And then contextual adaptation, adaptation systems will come along. Now, you determine where you are in the process as a product manager. Uh, Let's say you have a system like Nest thermostat, right? Nest is right now here. If you have Honeywell, or Honeywell, what's the name of it? You most probably will towards there. I don't know if they have a new technology, but uh, then you can say, OK, here's my solution. Here's the market, and we're going to run towards this. And now, depending to your solution type, there are really three, three different solution types from AI perspective. One is task processing. It just does mundane tasks and repeat it repetitively. A decision support system, something supports human decision. Your uh, lane alert in the car when you drive is actually a decision support system. It tells you stay on the lane, don't cross the lane. Well, decision making system on the other end, it decides for you. You don't have to decide. It's your self-driving car. It just drives between the lanes. It doesn't even alert you anymore in, about the lane. So given these, Different solutions on the AI are in a different point today. Then this graphic is going to change in the future. But today, if you, if you have a task processing, if you have a task to be processed, uh, you can use any of these systems like adaptive handcraft. It's going to do better than human. I'm repetitive, constantly calculating something. And you cannot give it a human to calculate every day the same thing again and again. But I can run a job there on, the, uh, on some server. It's going to calculate every, every day the same report, right? That's something easy to do today by the same systems. But decision support, it's not at the human level right now. Uh, what we see is that if you need a decision support system, you better jump to some adaptive, uh, adaptive or statistical system to be closed. If you have rule-based system like handcrafted software, that's not going to help you to 
uh, do decision support that much. And if you have a if you need a decision making system, it's even uh, it's even more or here you need you need an adaptive system for sure. And there are not many decision support systems today. And this is gonna in improve. Uh, there will be systems which make decisions for us. That's what we see. Now, and you most probably heard of these like supervised learning, non unsupervised learning, or or reinforcement learning. That is from the technology perspective, right? But let's look at it from product perspective. And and that is actually your perspective. If you have a prediction problem, if you look at your product and you need a solution, prediction solution, or if you have an image classification problem or you need a solution for that, it, you can pretty much go today mostly with supervised learning. If you have a recommender problem or, I don't know, compression or targeting problem, you can go with an unsupervised learning solution. And if you're dealing with a solution about dynamic pricing, next best offer, then you could actually go today with reinforcement learning solutions. And the line is kind of blurring nowadays. You can use different solutions, different places, but pretty much what it says is if you, if you model by mapping input to output, the first one is good. If, you, if you're looking for patterns in the, in the data, then you can go with the second one. But if you, if you want to create models, policies relative to environment, then you can go with the last one. And your data scientists, data people will actually know this already, will, will give you the uh, required information. That's why I'm not going more deeper in that, into that. And let's see what time, 7.06, good. Environment, when you cognify your business, what are the environmental aspects? And not environment in terms of nature, but environment of your business. What are those aspects in cognification? And the uh, first one is, everybody heard of this most probably, the hidden or the black box AI problem. And many companies hit this problem. Here you have the Google example, Google News. Uh, actually, if you look at the word, em oops, word embeddings of Google News, uh, Bolut Bush et al. did the research, and they figured out that most of the Google News have incredible gender bias. And it thinks actually that uh, men are engineers and women are receptions. So if we use an NLP system, which is trained on word embeddings from Google News, and it's very, very common to train uh, NLP algorithms with uh, word embeddings from, from online sources, you will end up with a system which is biased. Think of a system rec or recruiting system where it looks at CVs and decides, tries to match us to different positions at, uh, in the company, and you create an AI system. If you don't know the bias, if you are not aware of the bias, and nobody still thought about it, then you will end up with a system which has this bias, and that will actually uh, create a problem for your company. And, that, and, the, and the responsibility is on the product manager to think that, okay, we have this model. Did anybody look into this? Like, is this, is this even uh, serving every aspect of my business, not just that high performance or that high accuracy, but also different aspects like, is there a bias? And so this is one thing you have to look into it. And there are a couple more from environmental strategy. So enforcing transparency, that's really important. And today you can enforce transparency using tools like Lime. And this tool gives, allows you to look into the model and see why the model made a decision and what was the input, what was the output. You can use tools like this. And this is becoming more and, pop, more, and more popular today. Then risk management on AI technologies, that's really important. That's your responsibility. Having a risk management strategy is really important. And adapting safety mindset. Elon Musk supports the uh, open AI. It's a safe artificial general intelligence strategy. And there are many, many places like Oxford has another group and they're also supporting uh, safe AGI. And that's gonna be more and more important going forward. Uh, you saw on the AI timeline, uh, in the end we have AGI, and we don't wanna really end up there surprisingly that AGI is trying to kill us all. And so that's something important when you create models and create technologies to pay attention to that. Self-driving cars, for example, you don't want them to, I mean, <laughs> hit people just because it thought it is, it is 
easier or cheaper or I don't know less more gas efficient for some reason. Right? These are all product managers' responsibility to think of these. It's not a data scientist strategy no, responsibility. And managing information security. Uh, everybody most probably heard about GDPR and those kind of things. Now there is white hat hackers nowadays. Bigger companies hire these companies, uh, small companies about white hat hacking. Uh, there is also white hat AI hacking. Uh, can your model be hacked? Uh, today they figured out there are many papers about it. Uh, you can fake an uh, AI model, Im especially image recognition, by just changing some pixels on the input image. It it thinks uh, I don't know, some kid is a banana suddenly. I mean, if you can do it on the street in front of uh, maybe in front of a self-driving car, which has image recognition, you can actually fake that fake fake it to think there is somebody, a person, or there is no person. So these are really interesting subjects you have to think of when you get to AI solutions and cognify your business. And there's like standards like 27001. That's also really important. This is an information security standard, but it will be applied to AI in the future. We believe that. Now, let's, this is the last one, relationships. And relationships is about the partnerships. And the question is, when you're cognifying your business, what should you should be looking in terms of partnerships. And there are a couple of strategies around that. And the driving factors, of course, are IP know-how. If you're a fairly mid-sized co company or small company, most probably you don't have hundreds of data scientists or scientists who are writing papers every day. And that means you're going to deal with IP a lot when you, when you want to implement some machine learning model or some AI, AI technology. And that is a good time to partner with other companies who provide these services. Another one is scaling, geo expansion. Uh, you can partner with companies who take, a, take your technology, AI technology, apply to other geo, uh, geo locations, and that will help to the time to market so you can get faster to market. License and regulations, that's really important. Privacy concerns, security, transparency. There are companies who are helping with this. So it is, you don't really have to create another team, privacy team, to deal with it if you don't have a bigger company, but you can hire companies who, who are going to help with this. And executives, of course. Now, <laughs> your product manager, you came up with these ideas, you have the solution, you talk with the engineers, and you come up with these uh, new groundbreaking solutions. Your executives need to have also the AI thinking. And this is not always possible. Like, you don't maybe have a CAIO. You may have a CTO or CEO. And in that case, it's also possible to partner with other companies, AI consulting companies, who will provide you the solution domain expertise at the executive level, as well as uh, the AI product lifecycle knowledge at the executive level. That, that, will, that will help a lot. And that's it. We are right on time. And we talked about people. Uh, practices and how to how do we identify AI opportunities and we talked about solution solution domain and we talked about environmental dangers and the strategies and we talked about partnerships and the driving factors I I hope you liked it and this is our company we are inception program member and we work with Northeastern University and and present here as well Thank you. So that was a great Thank presentation. You uh, we do have a couple minutes to take away for questions. If we have questions, uh, we can raise our hand and ask questions right now and dig deeper into the presentation. We have about like 10 minutes, 15 minutes there. But feel free to raise your hand. We do have a couple more drinks left over, so help yourself. Um, this is not a question for me. Uh, I wanted to know how you compare your company with that. What's the name of the company? Vigor 8. Figure. Oh, Figure 8. Yeah, Crowdflower. Yeah, this is Crowdflower. They renamed the Figure 8 now, right? Uh, well, first of all, they're a very, very big company. So that's the biggest difference. And Crowdflower started like uh, um, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. They were just doing data labeling at the time. But once you label so much data and you create that pipeline, and data is everything for AI technologies, uh, you actually all have all the technology for all the all the enterprise, all the solutions, and they're in a really good position right now uh, in order to provide all those solutions. 
yeah, the differences they're they're really big. Uh, second of all, uh, yeah, their team they're they're much bigger team and they have also much more clients. That's the difference. Another question? Yes. Sorry? Here. Yeah. Is there any specific case study you could talk about where you made this transformation happen? Like, you know, more of a legacy case? Uh, specification to do the transformation? Specific case study. Oh, specific case studies. Uh, yeah, I see, I see. Uh, yes, one case study. Uh, we worked on an image recognition, uh, image classification problem. And the, what the client needed was is be able to recognize wine bottles on the shelves. So if you go to a grocery store, there are like lots of wine bottles. And the, their role was actually to be able to count those bottles because they sell it to the stores. So the stores has to put it on the shelf and sometimes they disappear from the shelf and the shelf is empty and they want to see that. And what we did, we worked on a, a case, we worked on, a, on that case. We collected images from the stores and then trained uh, machine learning algorithms to detect certain brands. And they were able to go with the phone, with their cell phone, and scan the shelves in real time. And it was able to give the, uh, give the number of bottles to them. So that was one of the examples. Does that answer? Actually, my partner can give also more details about it, be more there. Any other questions? There's no more questions, we'll wrap up. There's one? You have questions? Yeah. yeah. You mentioned AI is different than what we previously described. So as a PM in AI, would it be difficult for a person to move away from the industry, leverage that knowledge, or it will be just the operational experience that we can improve in the like in the industry? Okay, the question is, when you move from one industry to another industry? As an AI PM. As an Correct. Correct. So, what kind of experience you can leverage from one industry to other? It seems like you mentioned that things are different. Correct. 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 You can you can leverage your team uh, team expertise, like how to work with the team and the methodologies, and the way you work with the data science, how you how you get in the data, how the data needs to be processed. But the missing part will be uh, definitely about the uh, specific how the technology works. For example, if you have a Recommendation engine, right, or recommender system, where it is, if it's a content-based recommender system, for example, you would, uh, it, you have, you have different entities. You have, uh, you have partners who provided the content, so you have to talk to those people, right? You have to un have the understanding to be able to collect that data and make agreements with different businesses. Then, as a product manager, again, you have to collaborate uh, with. Uh, with the data science team to be able to solve that solution. Then at the same time, uh, you need to have a perspective for the, on the consumer uh, consumer side, right? How to deal with thousands of maybe millions of users, which is totally different if you have a B2B solution where you have only 10 clients and uh, you don't have actually any, any other partner and you're working with the data science team only. So that, that is the biggest difference, that your business model if you look at your business model, the different section will tell you uh, how much you have to learn when you, when you switch. And that's why people who are coming from the consumer business uh, stay most in the consumer business. If you're in the B2B, you, you stay in the B2B. Yeah, we talked about lots of B2B companies, and, and we're coming from a culture where we work with consumer, like billions of users. I'm talking about 1.5 billion users. It's totally different than having just 10 customers compared, to, and this is a different problem to solve. One is like scalability, you have to talk with 
the data engineers with the engineering out high to scale and uh, other things, how to regulate that kind of user, what's the privacy, where now you have just a couple, 10 customers and it's much more contained and you can actually enforce more rules, those kind of things. Yes. I see media. Yeah, not all of them are there, of course. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a. Do you have a particular take on the opportunity in the media industry for this kind of transformation? Media, which media? News serving or TV? News. On, on, the, in, on the internet or on TV? Video or in, video? Uh, no. Online. Online? Text? All of it. All of it, okay. So, yeah, when we talk about online media, we're talking about multiple things. So it could be really video, audio podcast, or video, uh, video streaming, video podcast, or also esports is coming uh, really hard right now. And uh, you can use AI in a different, uh, different aspects. If, it is a, if it's text-based, you can use AI in a couple places. First, to recommend, to find the right content when you need it, where you are. And if it is video, it is more about analysis, understanding what's the video about, because with text, it is much more easier to run NLP and understand what is this text about. But it is harder to analyze a video and figure out what is it about, right? It could be anything. Same thing with image, image analysis, understanding what is this image about. And like also other things, you want to maybe ban or exclude certain content, which is which has maybe nudity in it, or maybe it has uh, profanity in it. So it is understanding the content, understanding the user, in understanding the context. In those three areas, you can use AI. Okay. The new Google News app, is AI Google News, all Google, everything is Google. So Google News has launched a new app, okay. both Android and iOS. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, there's a heavy focus on AI influence on it in terms of the recommendation system. I see, yeah, I see. Solution slide. All right, next one. This one? All right. Depends. Depends your problem. So, you know, what, what is your case? What, what are you trying to solve for it? Or what's the business process? Um, just like increasing revenue and customer engagement. Customer engagement, okay. Yeah. Online, online, online engagement, right? Okay. Of course, now, uh, yeah, so you're trying to improve your customer engagement or maybe customer acquisition or customer retention, right? Retention. Customer retention, okay. Now, in order to do that, you have to pull the data from your own. There are a couple ways. First, you can pull it from your own data source, and you can use the Google Firebase, right? It supports that. Not, or Google Analytics, sorry, Firebase was for the uh, mobile. And if it's web, you can use Google Analytics, and you can download the data from there. They allow that. If you don't have many users, and let's say you have only 1,000 users or 10,000 users, and that means if they're visiting, let's say, 10 times, that's not much data to run machine learning algorithms, you can buy data. And you can buy user behavioral data. There are many companies who sell data. Of course, this data is anonymized. I mean, you don't know who that person is. There is just a number. But it will give you behavioral information if your website aligns with that data source. So that's also another criteria. I mean, if you're running a, a car repair shop website and you, the data from a news website won't help you anything. So you can, you can explore those parts. All right. B two B products. B two products. You're saying you have a closed system where it serves to just the business, right? Not online, but. Okay. And how many customers do you have? Thousands of. 
of course, yeah, with that amount of data, if they're not using a lot, and then it is, it depends what you're trying to improve there. Like, uh, are you trying to improve user customer retention on this on this app or? So you want to improve the engagement. If you don't have much data, uh, there is not, from the AI perspective, uh, there is actually not much to do if you don't have the data. But uh, you can you can maybe run studies on that and uh, try different e experiment with that and see where it takes. But it, it totally depends on the solution. So if you're trying to improve user user engagement, you can still bring AI technologies in there. Some some smart smartness as a PM. You can always use your intuition. I mean, if there is some solution which gives you a better user experience, you believe that, and you can try these solutions. Like we have seen uh, today, for example, use uh, use TurboTax, or there are actual smaller uh, smaller solutions uh, in the accounting, and they come up with interesting AI solutions in the back end to calculate things automatically, uh, so they don't ask everything to you. So. At that, at that point, it's more about intuition and experimentation later on. Yeah. Cool.